So let's start with our first questions. How can we think about ICT for development? Well, one way we could think about it, and actually often people think about that way, is to just say, you know, more is better. And uh, we have more digital tools that's better for development, you know, that will automatically lead to more freedom, for example. The Twitter revolution is a very common term. So to say, you know, we have just more social networks, people will express their opinions and democracy will thrive. So, you know, more digital tools, better for development. This is usually called, the technical term for this attitude is called technological determinism. Now, actually, the oldest existing vision of an information society doesn't come from a scientist. Uh, it comes actually from a novelist called George Orwell, as you might be aware. And he, in the year 1948, wrote a book called 1984, where he described things like Big Brother is Watching You. That comes from him. And uh, we described a thought control where there was complete informational dictatorship, the thoughts were controlled, every action was controlled, the dictatorship didn't give you any room to act, breathe, think differently. And that's a very different vision of an information age. So, so is now information and communication technology good or bad, for example, for freedom? Well, Philosophers will tell us technology is neither good nor bad. It is simply a tool, a weapon, right? And think about the hammer, which is actually a very useful tool. If you want to build a house, it would be impossible without a hammer, but it can be also very dangerous. It depends on how you use it. Now, that's not the hammer's fault. Um, a modern version of this discussion would be the gun and gun legislation and gun control. So... Uh, guns can be useful for self-defense, an argument often made in the United States, but they can also be very dangerous. Is that the fault of the gun? Technological determinists would say, yes, it's the fault of the gun, because guns are made for killing people, and that is bad. Another example is the atomic bomb, a technology that is made for destruction. So it will destroy. Will, will it destroy? Well, actually, the example of the atomic bomb, it's been around for a long time. Yes, it has been used, but for the most time, we, we as humankind decided not to use it. So there seems to be a choice, and that is called the social construction of technology, that we socially construct the use of this tool, which can be for the good or can be for the bad. So... Is technology neutral? Philosophers will tell us technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. Because yes, a bomb and a gun are made to, you know, destroy things or kill things. So, but it's still, our, well, that's how it is with philosophy, including the philosophy of technology, right? You wish that they just tell you this way, that way, but they don't. They say it's neither, nor, and nor, but kind of like makes sense. So basically the takeaway is that even so technologies might be designed for rather this or that purpose, we still have a social choice in their construction. They are not completely deterministic in their use. So this basically leaves us with three different dimensions. First of all, we have the technology. The technology is then put to the use of something, it's used as a tool for different aspects of development. And third of all, the technology can be shaped in its application. It's a process of social construction. We have a choice on how to shape it. So it's very useful to have these three dimensions in mind when thinking about topics like ICT for D or all kinds of topics where technology is used for development. And basically, in this case, we start with a technology that consists of two different components. Uh, so first of all is the infrastructure. That's basically everything tangible. These are the cables, the computers, the phones, and so forth. And the generic services that 
make bring this hardware to life so it's internet services it's uh, social network services facebook twitter youtube email services and so forth that we use to you know make use of this infrastructure then we have the human capabilities and skills that take advantage of these machines human computer interaction and this we use in order to digitize information and communication flows in different aspects of society for example the information and communication flows in government in business in health and education we put them into electronic networks and that's why often there is the e in front e government for example however that's only temporal our children will not refer to the e-government, they will simply refer to the government, which naturally will mainly work in electronic networks. A big part of it will be digitized. Now, this is the necessary for digitization, but not sufficient. As I said, there is the policy, and this gives us the third dimension to it. Policies um, are basically, there basically exist two kinds. This is negative feedback and positive feedback. Positive feedback basically means you put oil into the fire. You know, you see something you like and you ramp it up. So this is incentives. For example, tax subsidies. That would be positive feedback and incentive. And negative feedback is you see something that you don't like and you put water into the fire. So you try to control it. For example, through regulation, through laws. And that's basically the two tools you have in order to guide this transition and put technologies to work. So to summarize, we have three aspects of how to think about it. For one, we have what we can call the development of ICT. We focus on bringing better technologies in, to making technologies cheaper, to developing services that might help us to fulfill our goals better. Then we have, this year's what called ICT for development. We put ICT at the service of health, education, business, government, and there are many more sectors. These arrows show how many, there are many other sectors. There is e-banking and e-security and e-dating, whatever you want. Um, and uh, these two are joined by these enabling sectors. Us humans play a crucial role here, making technologies work at a society level. And as the third side, we have uh, policy instruments, positive and negative feedback. Originally, I designed this cube after I had been sitting for long hours in many international conferences that got me quite confused. <laughs> I was working for 15 years at the United Nations Secretariat, where I had the honor to design and uh, coordinate the digital development strategy of Latin America and the Caribbean right from the beginning in the very early 2000s. And in, in these early years, there was still a lot of confusion about how to make information and communication technology, ICT, work for development. And during these high-level conferences, many opinions got contributed. Somebody would say the most important and all that matters actually in ICT for d is infrastructure. If there's no access, we don't need to talk about anything else. Somebody else would say, no, it's the human aspect. We have to train our people. It's the skills that they have. Somebody else would say, no, we have to digitize. Digitize government. That's actually all it is about because then the rest will, that's the catalyzer. The rest will just follow and somebody else, no, it's it's a national strategy, a policy strategy that we need. And then somebody else would say, no, it's actually about content, about providing generic services, social networks for our... So you get the idea. I got really confused. <laughs> In after one of these confusions, I sat down and, uh, and, and drew up this cube. And it, had, it has been really useful, at least to organize my thoughts on the topic. And several countries also have adopted it to to um, basically design and coordinate their national digital development strategy and also the first generation of the development action plan in Latin America and the Caribbean, ELAC 2007, is, we structured it around 
around the cube basically and the, the, one of the main benefits is that it's pretty flexible it doesn't tell you what's important and it's not a model it doesn't give you predictions but it is a conceptual framework that allows you to see how things relate and you can also exchange things so if you're not interested in e-health but in security or in labor e-labor and telework you, you can replace especially the applications the most important is that you always have these three dimensions. You have a technology at the service of a society and you have policy instruments to guide it into the right direction. So you have technological progress that is the engine of innovation in the way we do things in society. It's social change. And progress is not necessarily equal to development. It's it's just change, it's progress, things advance, we incorporate more technology, but that doesn't necessarily mean development. So we have this third dimension of converting progress advancements into development, into the well-being of how we ever define it. So you have these three things. It's a, a tool for what and so what. <laughs> so, so during the rest of this uh, lecture, we will play around with this cube, see how it interrelates. You know, regulation, for example, cross cuts across infrastructure as well as services, as well as e-government and infrastructure affects government, but also business. So we will, you can play around with this cube, and that's what we will do uh, throughout the rest of the lecture.